Yeah, nice to meet you too.
So I uh, let the mayor know that he could adjourn this meeting since they were coming up for the executive session. Yes. So I just let him know. That, uh, adjourn what meeting? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They just took a recess on the executive session. Well, good evening and welcome to your town hall. Having reached the hour of oh, 6.05, I hereby call to order this meeting of the Star Rita Town Council and inform everybody that it is um, being broadcast live and be recorded. Tonight we'll begin with our regular council meeting. After the pledge, I'll recess the regular meeting to conduct the Community Facilities District meeting for Rancho Sarita. In completing the CFD meeting, I'll reconvene the regular meeting uh, to include a study session with our PNZ Commission. Uh, tonight's invocation will be given by Assistant Chief Jay Carlick of Rural Metro Fire Department, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by our wonderful Boy Scout Troop 130. Uh, Jay? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer asking for your blessing upon this assembly and the town of Sarita. We pray for all those who selflessly serve the residents of this community, that they do so with able mind and skillful hands. We pray you will bless our community leaders with the wisdom to make the very best decisions for its people. Lord, above all, we pray for the health and safety of this community each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Pledge leader. Everyone, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Troop. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. You can um, have a seat if you'd like. I don't think you want to stand there for the whole council meeting. <laughs> uh, at this time, I'll suspend our town council meeting and commence with our Rancho Cerrita Community Facilities District meeting and hereby call that meeting to order. And Madam Clerk, may I have a roll? Board Member Bracco? Here. Board Member Davis? Here. Board Member Gillespie? Here. Board Member Morales? Board Member Priolo? Here. Vice Chairperson Egbert? Here. Chairperson Murphy? Here. Quorum present. Thank you. Uh, this particular call to the public is for the Rancho Cerita Community F Facilities District. At this time, any member of the public is invited to address the district board on any issue which is on tonight's consent agenda or any issue which the district board may la lawfully act upon at a future meeting pursuant to Arizona open meeting laws. The district board may not discuss the items, but individual members of the district board may respond to criticism made by those who have addressed the district board, may ask staff to review the matter, and may ask the matter to be placed on a future agenda. And I don't have any speaker cards for the CFD. Anybody like to address the CFD? Uh, seeing no movement, I will declare the call to public for that. Closed and move to item number four. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second, thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, having no more further business. Uh, we are adjourned of our community facilities district meeting. Madam Clerk, may I have a roll call for our town council meeting? Council Member Bracco? Here. Council Member Davis? Here. Council Member Gillespie? Here. Council Member Morales? Here. Council Member Prioli? Here. Vice Mayor Egbert? Still here. Mayor Murphy? Here. Quorum present. Thanks. And we have one quick uh, presentation this evening. Um, representatives of the Fraternal Order of Police, Pima Lodge number two, uh, 20, will introduce themselves. So at this time, if you'd uh, come to the podium, introduce yourselves, and begin your presentation. But I'd be remiss. Thank you for everything uh, you and all of the officers do to keep us safe. We read about all kinds of nutty things going on uh, every day of the week. and. 
I hope you have felt the appreciation of our council, but what I recognize on Facebook so often is the recognition by our community. They're always dropping off things and cards and cookies and things like that, so I hope you feel that appreciation from Absolutely. our community. Thank you. Begin. Honorable Mayor and Town Council, first of all, we just want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to be able to, to briefly introduce ourselves. Um, I'm SRO Petty. Um, I've been with the department for approximately 15 years. This is Sergeant Higgins and Detective Velasquez. Uh, Sergeant Higgins has been with the department for approximately 15 years, and Sar uh, Detective Velasquez has been uh, as well as about 17 years. So um, first of all, we just wanted to give you a little bit of background on the FOP, um, the purpose of what the union is. So the purpose for, for us is to be able to support our members. So what we do is we um, make sure that we have um, a good working relationship with the town council as well as the town manager and our, and our chief. Um, we represent our members um, in negotiation. So that's the sole purpose of what the union does. Um, we, ha we haven't had the opportunity to meet everybody, so again, this is why we wanted to be able to, to come out here and um, briefly introduce ourselves. So uh, if we see you in the future, please feel free to, to touch base with us. Uh, we're more, more than willing to be able to have any discussions with you. We know the MOU is coming up shortly, so um, again, we wanted to make sure that, that you were able to put a face with a name. So thank you. I appreciate thank you. that. Um, it, no other comments? Um, well, perfect. Th th thank you. Th thank you for being here, and um, I know that you work very closely with our town manager in those negotiations, and it's kind of how our flow, you know, works as a, as a council. So we appreciate, and I know you in particular, you know, were involved uh, rather recently in um, resolving a pretty sticky issue along with all, everybody that showed up on there. So again, our appreciation for everything that you did and. I know you're one of our fantastic SROs, so Thank we you. really appreciate, appreciate that. that. Thanks. Oh yeah, where's the dog? He's at home. The, the live one, not the not the robotic one. <laughs> he was working all day today, so he's pretty tired. Oh, okay. Well, that means you've been working all day today, and you're here tonight. Yes. Okay. Just want to acknowledge that. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next is item number six, which is a uh, call to the public for the town council meeting. At this time, any member of the public is invited to address the town council on any issue which is on tonight's consent agenda or any issue which the town council can lawfully act upon in a future meeting. Pursuant to Arizona open meeting laws, the council may not discuss the items, but individual members of the council may respond to criticism made by those who have addressed the council, may ask staff to review the matter, or may ask the matter to be placed on a future agenda. Do I have any call? No? Uh, seeing no cards submitted, I will uh, declare the call to public closed and move on to council member brief summary of events. Council member Morales. Okay. You're good. Councilman Davis. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to bring to everybody's attention back uh, a couple of weeks ago, La Posada was named as a gold level bicycle friendly business by the League of American Bi Bicyclists. Oh. Um, a fairly high achievement and one of only 1,500 members award winners in the country. Um, so I'd like to shout out to them for doing such a great job and you know, obviously keeping people active and you know, pursuing a uh, bike friendly community. Yep, Thanks. thank you. Council Member Priola. Two things. One, um, Shane Dilley and myself had a very successful meeting at Sonora at Rancho Saharita. The whole community turned out to hear the latest updates on fire service in Northern Rancho, uh, including people driving through the neighborhood, rolling down their windows and saying, keep that man, he's wonderful. <laughs> so I have to agree with them. That was great. The other thing is the, um, the collaboration with the Saharita Food Bank and other community members to provide cardboard uh, for the food bank to collect to do those bales where they get $50 per bale is expanded. Uh, the food bank's now picking up cardboard from Ashley Furniture, oh. and they're working with the post office. I was involved with that uh, to see if they could pick up the cardboard from Amazon when they make their deliveries on Sunday night. So it's going really well. It's exciting to see the collaboration in the community. Thank you. Councilman Brocco, Gillespie. 
Um, I was just very impressed with um, with the police department and the response to the issue at Walden Grove. That was amazing with the response, with the communication to the public. Uh, I don't think it could be handled any better. So thank you. I would concur. Vice Mayor. I was going to say something very similar to that. I also appreciated that they had the after event meeting with the public to be able to come and, and to understand more and to express concerns. And, and so I felt like great collaboration with the school and the police and everything. So thank you for all those, all of the different organizations and people that showed up to assist in that. Thank you. And I'll piggyback off of Councilmember Priello about the cardboard. Every Friday they send home uh, backpacks, so to speak, uh, for food. Uh, to the students that are, uh, for the most part, on free or reduced lunch. And the cardboard, just the cardboard collection, covers about half that cost, yeah, just by doing that. And that's hundreds of kids that um, are a benefit of that. They have a big machine, it's called Captain Crunch, um, that they compact that. So that was just another great partnership, so it, I would agree. Um, and then it's probably been three or four weeks now, but we had a, another great um, park and rec event um, out at um, Quail Creek Memorial Park with the Santa Cruz Car Nuts. So another great collaboration. Um, I think they had about 5,000 wristbands and they ran out. So I and anticipate um, in the near future they'll be coming, at, you know, call the public and just giving us some of the numbers. But basically all the money they collect, like the White Elephant and other great organizations they give back. And that particular case, they give it back to last year to the uh, two high schools for uh, the JTED, Joint Technical um, Education District for workforce development, for auto mechanics and things like that. So that was uh, really amazing. Um, I did have a chance to brief the Green Valley Saw Rita Realtors Association and give them an update on how all the wonderful things. And that came on the heels of um, smartassets.com. Uh, they ranked the 500 best suburbs in the United States. And only three um, communities in Arizona made the top 100. And we were one of those three. We were second. So that was a great um, achievement. So I, um, I think that serves us well as we move forward and talk about things like we'll be talking about in the future to keep us one of those great suburbs. But from my estimation, that doesn't start unless we're a safe community. So echo all those positive comments for the police department. Um, our next regularly scheduled meeting is May 27th, but we do have a special meeting on March 6th. So just as a reminder for the public. And well, I, we're doing, I think, an e-session early, but are we starting the meeting early on the 6th? The regular council meeting does begin at 5 o'clock. Okay. There will be an executive session during the council meeting itself. Okay. Thank you for that. Thanks for the clarification. Because we always start at 6, typically, but that one in particular will start at 5. Um, Madam Clerk, item number 8. Town manager's report highlighting employee and department accomplishments, capital improvement projects, development projects, and town events. Thank you, and Mr. Dilley, after you run the money down to Councilmember Priello for saying those nice things. <laughs> Thank you, you for proceed. the kind words, yeah. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, so it's, uh, once again, it's a pleasure of mine to be able to present to you uh, the February uh, report, Town Manager's report. It really is a culmination of, um, of Team Salarita's effort to advance uh, good community and well-being, and so um, it's uh, it's a pleasure to to be voice to that report here tonight, in summary fashion. Um, we have made some changes in our presentation a little bit um, to uh, recognize our new employees as they come on from month to month. Uh, it's something that uh, we hadn't done in the in the past year. We've hit the year uh, annual mark on these reports and thought that it was important to um, introduce this as a as an an element to the monthly report. We've got three new employees: uh, Richard Balms in wastewater um, as a plant mechanic, uh, Omar Duarte as a police officer, and Melissa Mata in the economic development and public affairs department. Um, so we welcome our new employees. <clears throat> um, also, as part of the, the change to our format, um, rather than 
recognize every employee on every anniversary. Um, we are highlighting the monumental um, milestones for an employee and their experience with uh, our organization. So we'll recognize five year, 10 year, 15 year, and 20 plus year, or 20 year, I guess. Um, in, this, in this month, we've got uh, two employees that we're recognizing, uh, Vincent Ramirez, uh, police sergeant, uh, hired in 2018. And, um, and 20 year judge, um, uh, Honorable Maria uh, Alvarez, uh, Avales. Please, Maria, come on up, please. Come on, 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 <laughs> and how smart do you have to be to start as a judge at 10? Oh, so, yeah, right? I mean, come on. Thank you for not aging me. I appreciate that. But, and thank you for getting my Montaño in there, too. My dad would be so happy about that. I'm extremely happy about that. Thank you all. Uh, it's been my pleasure to work here for the town all of these years, and I hope to continue for at least another 20. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so she'll be but 40. It, it's, yeah, exactly. it's been wonderful working here, though, working with everybody. With Shane, you've been wonderful to work with since you've started as well. And, and all of you who are new and, and um, you know, aspire to 20 years. <laughs> but thank you all for having me here. Well, thank you for your service to our community. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Judge, the uh, scarf looks um, rather fetching. So <laughs> I, I have to say, I had no clue how to even put this on. So <laughs> I hope it worked. It, it looks, looks nice. nice. I looks have nice. to also say, after this weekend's game, that it... It's ASU colors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't intentional. That wasn't intentional. Um, anyway, thank, thank you, Judge. Appreciate you coming up, and thank you for your service. Um, we then jump into some employee recognition. Mayor and Council, as part of our day-to-day uh, -day efforts, um, we are always in the mode of, of furthering our professional development. Um, sometimes it's uh, in education, sometimes it's in certification. In order to do some of the complicated services that we render to the community, um, certifications are absolutely critical. And so um, as part of the employee recognition, we wanted to um, acknowledge uh, several, you'll see that group down there under new work uh, related certifications. We've got, we've got individuals <clears throat> um, in building and in, in, in planning. Um, um, we've got, uh, park representatives there, we've got uh, uh, um, public works. And so uh, in the report spells out their names specifically, but uh, a continued effort to gain certifications to up our um, ability to provide quality service to this community as our needs grow and change um, each and every year. Um, also recognize um, our town prosecutor. She was invited, and it's going to be what to, I don't know if she's here or not tonight, but I think it's later this uh, this uh, earlier this summer. Um, but she's been invited to be a presenter um, at the um, I got it here Arizona Prosecuting Attorney Advisory Council. I guess it's in June, so it's quite an honor to be representing not only the town of Sarita, but um, representing that organization and, and continuing to um, uh, share um, real life experience and best practices and uh, Rona has been acknowledged as a leader in that way so really appreciate all she's doing and obviously we've got another picture there um, from ACMA uh, conference um, that we attended just about a month ago a little less than a month ago where uh, assistant town manager Beth Abramovich was recognized um, by earning a scholarship that awarded her uh, a whole year of membership um, free and her attendance um, to the conference was free as well. Um, so I really appreciate Beth and putting her name out there, representing the, uh, the town of Sarita and being recognized. Uh, there was, I don't know, five, 600 um, city managers in that room, um, professionals in this, in this line of work and um, seeing her up there was a real pride for me. So thank you. Really appreciate staff. We'll get into some major department highlights. Um, just to really spotlight a few, um, first and foremost want to is, yeah, Devin's here. Devin, why don't you stand up? Uh, Devin, this is his first month on the job as our new uh, Parks and Rec Community Services Director. 
uh, Devin, uh, really appreciate your uh, your service and your willingness to jump into that. And like the bow tie. I was just going to say, it. is that a requirement now? <laughs> uh, you have to wear a bow tie as part of the test? Only on Wednesdays. Man. Oh, only okay, on, thank only you. Only on Wednesday. <laughs> Does it spin? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so, Devin, welcome. Thank you. Um, the police department, uh, in our in our efforts to move towards accreditation, um, five of the command uh, staff level individuals were recognized uh, with additional accreditation, um, and uh, and that all is detailed in the report. Uh, we had the grand opening of the wastewater treatment new lab building. Uh, many of many of you were all out there um, celebrating with staff on uh, bringing that building online. Um, we also had a pretty robust and engaged uh, one-stop recycle um, event public works held here at uh, on campus and um, it was all very well attended um, furthering the department highlights um, economic development's been busy um, <clears throat> sponsoring um, being a, a civil silver uh, level sponsor at the international economic development council leadership summit in tucson um, they've also uh, recently presented to the um, the Green Valley uh, um, Chamber of Commerce uh, for a breakfast mixer. I attended that one and, and I uh, just was uh, so pleased with staff and the, their level of commitment to new business and our local businesses um, willing to help in every way. At that meeting, the next picture down, um, you see Melissa Mata. Um, she's uh, she's featured in a new video that will be presented to you guys at your March 6th, March 6th meeting on uh, the Grow in Salarita uh, program that just got rolled out um, where they really provide a, um, a ladder or a roadmap for businesses, whatever stage you're in, um, excuse me, whether it's, um, I thought I had, the, oh yeah, uh, ideation, which is where you just got the idea and you wanna make something of it incubation where you're taking that idea and moving it forward to acceleration and then um, transition into brick and mortar so um, as i heard melissa uh, present the program to all the businesses that were there at this breakfast i saw a lot of heads nodding and it's like wow this is great stuff and it really is and so i'm excited for them to present to you on the sixth um, public affairs has been really busy with a lot of psas going out um, we had the um, we had the Quail Crossing um, opening up and, and all the excitement and energy that's been around that. The emails have been flowing. Um, we'll let you know that um, um, we continue to try to make improvements there to help. Um, <clears throat> let's see, in the middle picture, you can barely see her face, but uh, believe it or not, that's Blanca Espino from Public Works. She is in Antarctica and she's representing well. She's got a Sarita, town of Sarita scarf on um, <laughs> there. And, and so we just wanted to spotlight her and, and uh, you know, our staff really represent us no matter where they're at, even in Antarctica. <laughs> and so it's all good. Um, want to also do a huge shout out. Um, this last month was a big one for our, our, uh, our town facility folks. Um, we had to physically move two departments. Um, the legal department was upstairs, now they're downstairs, and HR was downstairs, now they're upstairs. And that's quite a lift. And, um, and so I wanna recognize uh, Berto, um, Sergio, Jonathan, and, and John uh, for their help. And I, I know that if you were to ask anybody in HR or legal, they would just shout praises to these, uh, these, these men and the work that they did in moving um, uh, these departments where they're supposed to be. Um, let's see here. Lots of good information in this report, Mayor and Council. Um, I guess I'm just, I'm, again, I'm just summarizing, um, but please jump into that report and, um, and I hope you enjoy it if you haven't already read it. Um, we also covered uh, capital improvement projects. Um, <clears throat> two notables was, uh, you know, we are, we, we have the Twin Buttes Public Works building uh, on, on deck. Um, but because it's, it's estimated the cost for construction almost $4 million, given the fact that we know that we don't have enough funding to do all of the prioritized lists given um, inflationary costs, uh, costs tied to limited um, uh, supply chain issues, 
uh, we wanted to wait on pulling the trigger on this and, and present it with the whole and all the projects that you're going to hear and weigh in on on March 6th. Um, if it's still a, a, the, the top of your list as a, as a council, then of course we're ready to move forward with it. But we wanted to make sure you saw the big picture and understood all the demands on, um, on, our, on our shoulders as it relates to our capital projects and the funding that we have for them. Um, also wanted to definitely uh, make note of the fact that uh, the intersection now at uh, the, the new Quail Crossing Boulevard and Old Nogales Highway is in flashing mode. Um, so east-west traffic is a red flash and north-south traffic uh, is a, a yellow flash. Um, so uh, we continue to get emails on that, although I want to tell you that my, my notice is that those emails are fewer and far between than when they were when we first opened that intersection mm -hmm. up. Um, it's very important to note that, it, that um, there's, there continues to be requests to move that intersection to, to a four-way stop. Um, we have looked at this every which way. There are two compounding issues that prevent us from doing that. One is that all of the experts in traffic management, we're talking PhDs, engineering, you know, degrees, uh, you know, where the, the acronyms on the end of the letters on the end of the name are, you know, are really long, right? Um, they say that it would be an absolute mistake given, given how, um, uh, how we are creatures of habit. Um, that, that intersection has historically operated as it's, as it's represented today. North-south movement is free-flowing, cautionary because you're in an intersection. East-west movement is stop sign, um, and you yield to the north-south movement. Um, we continue to make efforts with uh, Union Pacific and the ACC to effectuate what we know is the ideal, and that's to fully energize those lights to have a more of a signalized intersection. But until we get the green light from those two entities, um, where we're at today uh, by every measure is the best that we can do right now. So I wanted to just put that on the table and let you know that we continue to look at it. We continue to respond to, to residents as they, as they provide their emails, but we are seeing fewer emails in number than we have historically since we opened it. Um, also recognize that on the planning and building side, you know, we've got the uh, Park Corporation's application for a zone change. Um, that's going to hit you on March 27th at your meeting. It's already been to planning and, and zoning um, with a recommendation to approve um, with condition. And so um, I know you guys are studiously uh, boning up for, for that discussion, understanding the issues. I applaud the questions coming into staff. Um, we'll continue to field those questions for you and help you feel prepared so when it gets in front of you for discussion, you're ready to go. The other, uh, the new item is the, um, the Vulcan Materials Company uh, petition for a, a conditional use permit. It's a type three permit. Um, that process will involve uh, public hearings, opportunity for the public to be engaged. Um, uh, those public hearings will first hit the Planning and Zoning Commission um, where the public can, um, can get out ahead and, and express their concerns and their thoughts. Uh, following the Planning and Zoning Commission's um, process, and that, who knows how long that's going to be. I mean, the Planning and Zoning Commission have the opportunity to, to you know, to table decisions, um, continue public hearings, make sure that all the information is on the table before they weigh in. Once they're done with it, then it'll come to you as a council, and uh, you'll be afforded the same opportunity as well as the public uh, to engage and to, um, to share thought and opinion to hear all the details and, um, and eventually weigh in on uh, what the outcome is going to be. So um, stay tuned on that, but that, uh, that, is, that, is, uh, that process is underway and starting. Happy to answer any questions on the report, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions for Shane? Any questions? No? Thanks for a very comprehensive report, as always. Appreciate it. Uh, Madam Clerk, item number nine, please. Presentation, discussion, and possible action regarding the 2023 legislative session updates. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mr. Barrett, um, our management analyst, will introduce this item and introduce our special guest. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, 
Yeah, so I want to cover some of, the, uh, some of the things that have been going on in the legislature over the last month. I'll give you a quick session roadmap. I want to talk a little bit about SB 1184. Uh, I'll call your attention to a few other priorities that we still have on the docket. Uh, I will not be speaking about dead bills tonight, although if you do have some questions about what bills we think are mostly dead, um, shoot me an email and uh, I can give you a rundown. Um, so legislative roadmap, the session roadmap. Um, we're done with phase one of the legislative session, the, the whack-a-mole uh, part of the legislative session where there's 1,600 bills and you're just trying to cover every single one of them, figure out what kind of impact they're going to have, if any, try to track them, try to keep tabs on that. Uh, last week was crossover week. Uh, that means that uh, uh, House bills needed to clear a House committee by that deadline and Senate bills needed to clear out of a Senate committee by that deadline. Uh, bills that did not meet that deadline now are mostly dead. Um, so the universe of bills that we can focus on is now much, much narrower. So in this second phase of the legislative session, uh, our focus shifts to that uh, smaller universe, but we also turn our gaze to the, uh, to the budget and the budget process. At this point, that's discussions that are going on behind closed doors between leadership, uh, between the legislature and the, and the governor's office. Um, but we will try to... Uh, when we can put our ear to the door and, and listen to what's going on. Uh, the next deadline to uh, uh, keep an eye on is March 24th. That's the last day by which House bills have to clear a Senate committee and Senate bills need to clear a House committee. So March 24th, so that's kind of our next, uh, uh, our next deadline that we're keeping an eye on. Um, I wanna give you a Somewhat extensive update on SB 1184. This is a bill that would have prohibited cities and towns from collecting sales tax on residential leases. Uh, this was very much a local control issue. Uh, the state of Arizona does not collect any TPT from such leases, but 72 cities and towns do. Uh, so we had here a bill that, uh, where one jurisdiction was, was telling another jurisdiction which taxes to collect or not to collect. Uh, so very much a, a local control issue. Uh, the governor vetoed this bill uh, late last week, February 23rd. Her reasons for vetoing it uh, were, were two reasons, uh, two points. First, the bill that passed, SB 1184, had a stipulation that uh, landlords were to reduce the amount of rent by the amount of tax that they had been collecting. But the governor noted that there was no way to track that or enforce that. It was just kind of a, uh, a dead letter in the bill. Uh, her second reason was that the bill also carried a, an appropriation to attempt to keep cities and towns whole. You know, cities and towns that could no longer uh, collect this tax would receive for a year and a half uh, some general funds uh, to keep them whole for a little bit. But the governor noted that appropriations should not be done in such a piecemeal fashion, that all appropriations should be done as part of a single comprehensive budget uh, process. So uh, that was the second reason for her veto. Now, I don't want to overstate the town's uh, role in the governor's veto, but the sequence of events does speak for itself. <laughs> in reality, this was very much a, a team effort uh, between the League of Arizona Cities and Towns, individuals, cities and towns, uh, Mayor Murphy, um, uh, the professional staff here with the town of Sawarita, um, all provided Governor Hobbs with um, with the, uh, the, the, the political uh, justification, the, the reasons, the um, ability to, to veto this bill that, that would have had uh, detrimental consequences for, uh, for the town. Okay, before I move on, any questions about SB 1184? Or the fact that, you know, I got to shake Governor Hobbs hand. It was really neat. Okay. Uh, legislative updates. Uh, as I said, there, there were 1,600 bills that have dropped in the session already. That universe has dropped considerably, but there are still a, a number of bills on our, our, our plate, on our, our radar. I'd say you know, 10 to 15 bills. Uh, I've got six here on the screen, but I'm only going to talk about three in the interest of time. Uh, so we are tracking a lot of bills. Again, if you have questions about any bills that you're hearing about, uh, you know, give me a call, shoot me an email. Uh, these are generally in priority order, so our top priorities are near the top of this list, bottom priorities are in the bottom. And that's just the bottom of these six that I'm, I'm showing you, obviously. 
Uh, so top priority home-based business restrictions, prohibitions. Uh, this is a bill that would uh, restrict cities and towns from putting prohibitions or requirements on home-based businesses um, if they meet certain requirements um, that they call no impact home-based businesses. Uh, I spoke about this at the last council meeting. No impact businesses are defined as minimal employment, but that could still be up to three family members who are not residents of the house. Um, no on-street parking or increase in traffic. Uh, the activity is not visible from the street. Before this bill passed the Senate, an amendment was added to include no odors or sounds. Um, as I said, this bill has passed in the Senate. It passed on Wednesday on a 16-13 vote. So we're going to be keeping an eye on this. Uh, we'll, be, uh, uh, we'll be weighing in on this if, if council so desires, uh, sending out a uh, policy statement, um, having Karen Cruz, our, consul our uh, legislative consultant, work the issue uh, if need be. Uh, next up on our priority list, uh, SB 1268. This is a bill that would increase the um, requirement for annexation. Uh, normally, you, in an annexation position, petition, you need 50% of the population and 50% of the value of the land uh, to sign said petition. Uh, this would increase that threshold to 60%, uh, making annexations uh, much more difficult. Uh, this bill is still in the, uh, uh, in the Senate. Uh, it has passed out of committee and it's passed out of the rules committee as well. Um, so we're keeping an eye on this to see if it does pass out of, out of the Senate. Uh, and again, we are working it uh, uh, with individual legislators uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to skip down to SB 1117. This bill actually would have a huge impact, uh, but it's a lower priority on this list just because, um, because this is the League of Arizona Cities and Towns top priority. So we've already got a big army standing up uh, on this. So it's, it's a lower priority for, for town staff because heavy lifting is being done elsewhere, but it is still a priority. So we are still keeping our, our eye on it. We will weigh in on it uh, if need be. Uh, in a nutshell, this bill would uh, preempt a number of zoning regulations uh, and disallow cities and towns from certain types of, uh, of zoning. And it would allow by right very small lot sizes uh, in every city and town uh, in Arizona. Um, so as I said, that, that's a priority. We've got that working on that issue from a number of different angles. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to end my presentation for tonight. Uh, but again, I can answer any questions you might have right now. Or as I said, shoot me an email, give me a call. Um, I have a passion for talking legislative issues. So, you know, you would be doing me a favor if you gave me a call. <laughs> Well, thank you for the presentation, Karen. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, even especially the, the annexation, all of our efforts for CCAP, the map behind you, Nathan, um, to go from 50, which is not easy, um, to go to 60%, um, again, you know, it sort of circumvents the local control, you know, issue of our, our residents. So uh, thanks for all the work that you're doing. Um, any questions from the council for either Karen or Nathan? Nothing? Thank you, thank you for being here. Karen, did you wanna say anything or you don't have to? Okay, all right, thanks, appreciate it. Um, Madam Clerk, oh, uh, item number 10 is the consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion on that. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> uh, all in favor signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Madam Clerk, item number 11, please. Discussion and possible appointments to the Board of Appeals. Uh, thank you. And is, oh yeah, I was looking for you, Anna. Anna Cassidy uh, will, will be introducing our nominees. Welcome, Anna. Thank you, Mayor Murphy, members of the council. We have two nominees tonight. We have David Tyrell, who is being nominated for the mechanical engineer position. Mr. Tyrell is a principal mechanical engineer at Zona Technical Engineering. He's a member of the local American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers chapter, and a member of the AABC Commissioning Group. He's also a lead accredited professional. Mr. Tyrell has 20 years of experience in mechanical and plumbing design on some of the most significant projects in Southern Arizona, and he's been serving on the Board of Appeals for us since 2013. Uh, Mr. Tyrell, are you here tonight? Would you like to stand up and say hello? He's shy. 
No. <laughs> I'm not seeing Mr. Tyrell, mm -hmm. but I would like to thank him for volunteering and for his commitment to the town. Secondly, we have Dave Hughes, who is nominated for our alternate member position. He is a retired industrial engineer with vast experience designing and installing mechanical systems. Before retirement, Mr. Hughes was a professional engineer registered in Illinois and Kansas. He was a licensed mechanical installer, master plumber, and fire sprinkler contractor. Additionally, Mr. Hughes is an energy manager and is LEED certified. Mr. Hughes was a board member and chairman of the Board of Appeals in Wichita, Kansas, and he's been serving on our Board of Appeals since 2021. Mr. Hughes, are you here tonight? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your continued commitment and for the, the time you'll spend working on our Board of Appeals. Uh, thank you. No, and, and you know, our town really doesn't run without our volunteers and to see that level of expertise um, in education um, and still willing to be served. So thank you for being here and thank you for your continuing efforts to help serve our community. Um, does anybody have any questions before I make a motion for Anna on either of those? Seeing none, I'll move to reappoint David Terrell and David Hughes to the Board of Appeals. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you again, sir. Really appreciate it. Madam Clerk, item number 12. Joint Planning and Zoning Commission and Town Council Study Session regarding a proposed amendment to the zoning code related to residential zones. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll commence with our joint study session. This is a joint session with our Planning and Zoning Commission, another group of volunteers. We really appreciate that. Uh, to review the uh, residential uh, zones code amendment. And um, I apologize, we wanted to join you at the table, but we have a little issue with a shortage of microphones, so we're gonna work on that, because uh, I wanted it, uh, but I hope you feel uh, that we're working together on this. And at this time, I'll defer to Chair Backer uh, to call the planning and zoning meeting to order and take a roll. Thank you, Mayor Murphy. Uh, at this time, I call the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to order and request uh, Madam Clerk to per, uh, do a roll call. Thank you. Commissioner Hernandez, absent. Commissioner Megren, absent. Commissioner Maynard, here. Commissioner Millet, here. Vice Chair Miramontes, here. Chair Backer, here. Quorum present. Thank you, and Ms. Cassidy, who you just heard from, is our Planning and Building Director, and will begin and present this item. Anna? Thank you, Mayor Murphy, members of the Council. I'm going to have Dylan Perry do the presentation tonight. He's been um, the case planner on this amendment and knows it in and out. Thank you, welcome Dylan. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Murphy, members of the Council, Chairman Backer, members of the Commission, as you are aware, the Planning and Zoning Division has been working on a text amendment to the residential zone sections of the town code. When we started this amendment, we established three goals for it. The first one was to simplify the residential zones for the users. The second was to better reflect the character of the town of Salarita. And as, you, as most of you would be aware, the uh, town code was adopted from Pima County in 1994, and the residential zones was largely untouched since then. And the third trend was to provide for newer trends in residential development. And that came out of a housing study that was done by the town. And after that, a housing strategy. And in order to do that, to implement some action items from that housing strategy, that was the third goal of this amendment. The purpose of tonight's study session is to inform you, the commission, and the council, and the public of the results of the public outreach process and present the highlights of the draft amendment including the changes we made to the amendment since the previous study session. We also want to collect any feedback that you have prior to bringing the amendments back before you for notice to public hearings. So we started our industry outreach last August and we did some presentations before the Better Together Committee, the Metropolitan Pima Alliance, and the Southern Arizona Home Builders Association. At that point in time, we also established a project page on our website and we sent out a draft to members of the development community. We had that study session at the end of September, which was the kickoff for our public outreach process. And we started the public outreach with a virtual meeting on October 11th 
and an in-person public meeting on October 19th. Neither of those meetings were very well attended, although we did receive some good feedback. So after that meeting, we did change the, uh, the method we were using for the public outreach, and we went to doing a series of pop-up meetings at local parks. So between November 8th and December 8th of last year, we held four pop-up meetings with three of them at Animax Park and one at Park Los Arroyos. And then on December 17th, we were uh, part of the information booth at Winterfest handing out information cards to residents of the town. So the results of the outreach, as I mentioned, the in-person and virtual meetings were not very well attended. The pop-up meetings were that we got much better attendance at the pop-up meetings and we were able to get about 45 residents to come out to those four meetings. They also had a number of those also took uh, information home from their neighbors, so hopefully the outreach was uh, reached out to a few more people than those that were in attendance. At Winterfest, I was able to hand out about 35 project information cards to residents. And the feedback that we did receive from the public, they were generally supportive of the amendment. The most common concerns that came up were related to tiny homes, and specifically tiny homes on wheels was a concern as well as people concerned about having a tiny home go next door to them. The other issue that did come up was parking, and that was related to accessory dwelling units. And the concern mostly stemmed from the fact that people felt that parking was already an issue in some of the areas, and they were concerned that adding accessory dwelling units would make the parking issues a little worse in those areas. So now I'm gonna go through each of the goals and how we uh, attempted to meet those goals with this, what, was, what we're proposing. So the first one, again, was to simplify the code. And in order to do that, we took the current code, which is made up of 13 individual chapters that make up the residential zones, and we condensed that down to one chapter. And in doing that, it allowed us to also just create one table of uses, and that's a table where people can go to find out whether or not a, a use is permitted and what zone it is permitted. So now they would not have to go to each individual chapter, but just the one chapter to find that information. We're also eliminating some unused zones. These are zones that you can find in the zoning code, but that there is no land in the town with that zoning designation. We're also creating a new manufactured housing zone while eliminating the trailer home site zone. This does affect two properties in the town that do have the trailer home site uh, zoning designation currently. However, they will still be able to continue to do what they're doing on their property now. It just changes the name of the zone. We created a development standards table for main buildings, one for multifamily structures, and one for accessory structures. These tables highlight what the minimum lot size requirements are, setback information, and um, maximum heights. We also are creating a uniform standards for lot coverage for accessory structures. Those would be the, uh, sheds, detached ramadas, those type of things. And under the current code, there are certain zones that have different methods for calculating the lot coverage and some of them are not as easy to, to use as others. So we're going with a standard that is based on a percentage of the overall lot size, so it'll make it a lot easier for a homeowner to determine how much square footage they could have for in terms of accessory structures on their lot. And then finally, we are replacing guest houses, rear dwellings, and secondary dwellings with accessory dwelling units. And I'll get to the accessory dwelling units on the, in the, um, a little bit further in the presentation. So the second goal was to better reflect the character of the town of Salarita. And again, uh, since the code was originally adopted from Pima County, there are some uses in there that are better suited for more rural areas and that we felt are incompatible with the growth of the town. Those include the hog ranches, animal racetracks, airstrips, and commercial feedlots. I will mention here that we did have some residents that were concerned that this would affect things such as 4-H and those type of uses. This will not impact that at all. Um, this is a much larger scale um, type of hog ranches and those things that this impacts. The third goal was to allow for newer trends in residential development. We identified four types of trends that we were looking at. The first one is the accessory dwelling unit. And this is something that's looked at as being one of the best ways to bring additional housing to the community with minimal impact. Um, the, another option is a single family build for rent communities and then tiny homes and small lot subdivisions. So as far as the ADUs go, uh, the current code has three different types of accessory dwellings. They have the secondary dwelling, the rear dwelling, and the guest house. 
Each of those has its own uh, standards that they go by, and some of them are allowed in, in certain zones and others are not. And um, if you remember at the, at the previous study session in, in September, we were also talking about casitas at that point. Uh, we have eliminated the casita option as well because the, there was a lot of uh, discussion going back and forth on whether or not it mattered whether or not there was a kitchen in the accessory dwelling unit. So we have uh, taken the casita option out as well and, and we're just going with the accessory dwelling unit. So how does the ADUs compare with the current regulations? The guest house is the most commonly used type of accessory, accessory dwelling in our current code, and that's because it's allowed in any residential zone with a lot size larger than 16,000 square feet. It is not allowed to have a full kitchen. It's limited to one per lot, and the maximum size is 45% of the floor area of the main house. Under the proposal, we are proposing to allow ADUs by right in zones with a minimum lot size of 8,000 square feet or greater. They would be allowed a kitchen. It'd still be limited to one per lot, and the maximum size proposed right now is 1,000 square feet. So as part of, uh, well, all right, there we go. So as part of this looking into ADUs, I did some modeling of lots in the town. Uh, so I took a, uh, the dimensions of a lot, create, created that, and then took the dimensions of the house sitting on the lot, and then tried to fit an ADU into the backyard of those houses. So the one there on the left is a house that you would find in the Colonius Lot, in areas of the Colonius La Cañada uh, neighborhood and the Santa Tomas del Norte neighborhood. It's approximately a 9,000 square foot lot. And that accessory dwelling unit that's shown there is approximately 450 square feet. The one on the right is a house that you would find off of somewhere like Woodacre or Bosque Drive. It's about a three quarter of an acre lot and that accessory dwelling unit is approximately 875 square feet. So you can see the one there on the right, it could easily go up to the 1,000 square feet and have no problem. Um, the one on the left, being a smaller lot, it, it's going to be more difficult to get to that 1,000 square feet. And then this third one here. Dylan, can I just pause you? I think yes. the vice mayor. Yeah, can you go back for just a second? I just yeah. want to make sure I understand this. Both of these lots would be allowed to have an ADU. That is correct. That's correct. Okay, but the the small home on the left side is what type, what size of ADU? That, a, that ADU is 450 square feet, approximately. And, and we, and under this proposal, that would be acceptable? Correct. Okay. I don't think the back neighbors are gonna appreciate that. <laughs> and, um, why we're there too can you just touch on dylan um you know we already have established neighborhoods with hoas and ccnrs and those types of things can you just kind of clarify what portion of the town that we're considering this to be applicable to mayor murphy uh this would this amendment would not apply to rancho sarita it wouldn't apply for the most part to the other specific plan communities either unless their specific plan was silent when it came to accessory dwelling units. Um, and then as far as HOA communities, it's gonna depend on their CCNRs. Right. So for the most part, this is sort of new property moving forward that any home buyer moving in, if we approve this in the future, will be aware that these are possibilities as they purchase and build, correct? Mayor Murphy and members of the council. So there is a, a portions of areas off of La Cañada, which are gonna be older neighborhoods that do not have HOAs and are not parts of specific plans. This would apply to those areas. Okay. Thanks. Well, Mayor, just, just for clarification, a new, if a new development comes in, even with this code change, the development could prohibit the ADU building going in by way of its CCNR. By way of the it just CCNR. gives them gives the, a new developer or a new development the opportunity to do it, but they wouldn't be required to. Okay. They could prohibit them by way of the CCNRs. Thanks for that clarification. So this, this last one here is uh, it's a typical lot in the Santo Tomas neighborhood, and uh, as you'll see, this is a t approximately a 250 square foot accessory dwelling unit. 
that is all that would be enabled to fit in that backyard to meet the setback requirements for uh, an accessory dwelling unit. So there are a number of lots that would have a difficult time trying to, to fit one in, and especially if they already have, uh, say, a pool in their backyard or anything like that. Um, the, the obviously, the larger lots would have an easier time uh, fitting an ADU. Mayor, could I ask a yes, question? Yes, yes. So, Dylan, all of these, uh, all of these illustrations um, reflect a um, a detached ADU as opposed to an attached ADU uh, or an ADU that's actually under the same rooftop, right? So. Do you do you have any guidance for council in terms of what that might look like? Um, because I know that those options exist out there in the world where where you've got detached and attached and you know within under the same roof. Um, so yeah, can you weigh in on that one a little bit? Yes, we didn't um, we didn't show any attached ones because in the code as it's proposed, if it's an attached ADU, it would have to meet the same setbacks as the house. So like the case on the left, um, if they just moved it to the left a little bit and attached it, it would actually be further away from the setback requirements, correct? But does it put it in a different category if somebody wanted to expand that house um, on the left and attach that ADU would it still be considered an ADU, or would it be considered a uh, an expansion of your house? Mr. Mayor? Yes. If they attach it to the house and it goes over a certain amount of square footage, they might also be required to uh, add sprinklers to the house. Putting it over the square footage. Right. Correct. Right. Yeah. Mayor Murphy and council members, we... Um, so if it was attached to the, the back of that house, it would put it further away from the rear property line. Right. However, the house itself is because it has larger rear setback requirements than the accessory dwelling unit if it's a detached accessory dwelling unit. Um, you'll have to repeat that. I got so lost on that. The, the accessory dwelling units, um, if this was a 8,000 square, which this one is, is an 8,000 square foot lot, yep. has a five foot rear setback requirement. The house itself would have probably a 10 or 15. Oh, I see. So if they attach wait, 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 wait. Why does that make any sense to anybody? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's setback is setback, right? I mean, that's what it, I, yeah. I, so, what, so I'm going to separate it by a foot or two as opposed to adding I, an addition, but I can't add an addition. I have to have a separate unit. Right. Because it makes no sense on there. Could you kind of address that on why, if it's okay to be at a five foot setback because if it's, it's an ADU, but if you attach it, now you might violate the 10 foot setback, but it's actually further away from the back wall than it would have been as an ADU. So Mayor Murphy and members of the council, if, if we, in order to do that, we'd have to change, and that's obviously something the council wants us to look at, we would have to change the rear setback requirements for the house in general. Um, because at that point, to the, as far as we were looking at it, if they attached, let's just say they expanded um, a room expansion instead of an ADU to the neighbor, it makes no difference as to, to what's inside that room. Um, so we would have to, our thought was that we'd have to change the rear setback requirements. For, I, for I just like itself. consistency and regulate right. requirements. Right, because if I'm potentially the rear neighbor, it kind of doesn't make sense if they could attach it to the house, they actually setback would be further away but we're preventing them from doing that because the setback for ADU is down to five feet. Um, I don't know, it just doesn't make well, sense they, to if me. If it was attached, they could um, uh, put in an application for a modification of setback also. Right. you're allowed to encroach into the uh, main setback. Uh, but that's more bureaucracy. Why would we need that? If we're gonna let them come to five feet against the property line, why not five feet universally? I, I believe those setbacks are set by the building plan with, before the uh, homes are even built. It's a part of the town. Um, right, and that, Council Members Bracco kind of point is, well, if we're gonna allow an ADU to be a five foot setback, why aren't we allowing the homes? Not saying that that's a good idea or not, it's just that it, it, it's consistency or kind of lack, I guess, of common well, sense. You know, I, I, I think you're gonna see, like I, I have a multi-acre property um, and when I first read through this um, the other day, uh, my first thought was with the full kitchen that my next rental is going to be on my own property. 
Right. Uh, because I do have the space and the requirements. And everybody, uh, I'm one of those properties on La Cunada that Dylan was referring to. So I think you're going to see more people um, uh, look to do that. And I know it was discussed at the last meeting that there are uh, limited units uh, of rental with the apartments coming in and stuff like that. Right. And this could be. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor? First. Yes. I think it's absolutely crazy that we are putting homes five feet away from property owners, fences and fence lines. This should never be allowed. People did not move to Sarita for urban style living. They came to suburban and rural style. And this is encroaching on a suburban and, and rural area. The fact that you can have somebody's home less than f five feet from your property line is ridiculous. I think the property, the the square footage of the lot should be significantly larger than 8,000. You know, Mrs. Uh, Vice Mayor, when you go to places like Redondo Beach, um, Hermosa, things like that, there are a, almost every single home has uh, an accessory dwelling on it, and um, you don't see a lot of people complaining about that. It's, um, it's they're nice neighborhoods, they're well taken care of, they're relatively quiet. Uh, Mr. Maynard, just to, I sent a note, a picture of a container a shop shipping container in somebody's backyard that had an air conditioning unit and a door and it was that was what their secondary dwelling I don't think that that is what Sarita and our residents would want is to have shipping containers sitting behind right. five feet from their thing but, but I think we have right but I think that's kind of a separate issue one is what the structure looks like right which I think we do control but I'm still and, and, and that's fine to have this discussion well, and at five I, feet yeah. but back to Councilman Bracco's point if five feet isn't you know acceptable because ten was what we wanted for a home, but if it is accept acceptable for an ADU, then it should be acceptable for a home. Um, and if it's not, then maybe the lot sides. You know, if we all decide ten feet is ten feet, then to me it shouldn't be. We shouldn't care if it's attached right. to it or that's right. that's if it's an ADU, is. right? But yes. we could have that. Obviously, this is the time but to weigh in it, on how far. Wouldn't we that want. be a part of what the uh, uh, HOAs do um, in, in their guidelines. You well, know, and that, and that they, was because you, you, you look at Quail Creek's guidelines, and their setbacks are uh, a hard ten, even on freestanding units or attached. Right. The, uh, where the town says that I, I can have um, a freestanding unit um, three feet um, from the back wall, um, but Quail Creek says no. Right. Our, our, we have a hard line at ten feet, so I, I think that um, would be something that the uh, HOAs would have to uh, determine. Um, yeah, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor and Council. Well, um, the Chair Becker hadn't had a chance. He just wanted to say something really quick, and then I'll go back to you, Shane. So Chair. in Madera Highlands, uh, our family just bought our second house in Madera Highlands, and on one side of our home, the setback is three feet, and throughout most of Madera Highlands, the side setbacks are about five feet, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Right. Yeah, we're not seating. Yeah. Right. Uh, Shane, you weigh in, but uh, to your point, Mr. Mayor, um, as Mr. Palladini pointed out, you know, the HOA today, or in the, more importantly, in the future, can working with us, and you know, this is where going through the planning department, they would be aware if this is something that wouldn't be acceptable, the HOA and the developer gets to write the CCNRs to prevent that. Shane. I would think that on an issue like this, um, you know, we wouldn't want to um, we wouldn't want to relinquish our authority as a town on these development standards to an HOA and just rely on that. We would establish the baseline minimum criteria, and if an HOA wanted to become more restrictive through their CCNRs, they certainly can. But we would ultimately want to establish a standard and be comfortable with that standard uh, across the entire community. Right. Thanks. No, I, I agree with that. Um, and, but to me, whatever we decide, I think it should apply, whether it's attached or not attached. But if we decide five feet isn't, you know, as a council, to me, it shouldn't, you know, necessarily matter. I, I, um, I didn't mean to bring up the attached or detached to take us down a rabbit hole, but I, I know that it's very, very common to have attached ADUs in other in other jurisdictions. I, I you know, I've seen it firsthand, sure. and so, you know, it, it made sense to me to, you know, to actually, you know, just introduce the the concept because all we are seeing here is detached but right. they are attached and sometimes the attached for economy purposes you know ec economics it makes more sense for the property owner to do an attached in fact i've seen adus considered under the same roof line so you don't you're not even adding more roof line it's it's it maybe you 
maybe you convert yeah, um, the, the yeah. attic of the you know above the garage right. as an ADU. I, I mean, I've seen all sorts of creative ways to do right. an ADU or enclose a patio, enclose a patio, uh, something. Roof structure. I mean, it has to make sense, but that flexibility is what we're kind of talking about here. And and so, uh, even on a small lot like this, so I see the front. You know, you, the front of that house has a single story garage, right? Right. But somebody could actually raise the roof line on that and and put it a, an ADU on top of that garage, and right. you haven't you haven't done you haven't done anything to the setbacks of that property, um, you know. So I, I just I just want to make sure that our minds are a little more open than just seeing these detached um, units and and how they may impact the neighborhoods. Right. Well, it, it, and again, my my argument is just consistency. Whether it's right. attached or detached should not determine how close it is to the back wall. Right. Um, Anago, and then if Dylan, you wanted to continue, and then we can uh, finish up your presentation. But thanks for that pause. I appreciate it. Anna? Sure. Thanks, um, Mayor Murphy. I appreciate all the discussion, and I'm hearing what you all are saying. Uh, I'm hearing the two different issues one, as to whether the setback should be the same for whether it's attached or detached. And I, I think I understand the direction that the council wants us to go with that. So we'll make those changes. The discussion about the five feet versus the 10 feet, it would be really helpful to get some more direction from the council and the commission as to what you'd like to see. We can certainly write it the way that you'd like to see it. So um, however you want us to take that, please let us know. Yep, no, I appreciate that. And because uh, you are a guest here, I'd, first I'd love to hear from each of you, the four of you that are here, because you heard some of that discussion on five, ten, is it eight? I, I, but you get you get these a lot, all right? You've, you're the you're the starting point for us. So I'd love to hear from the four of you first, and then we can. Uh, I'll open up to the council for um, for thoughts. Dan, do you want to start? Yeah, I, I would say that the um, to to make it um, to change the setbacks to be you know more tighter against the property line. I, I I wouldn't think that would be the right approach I would say existing if in the case there was like a three foot setback and that's that's where you you know for that particular zoning you start with there you know that that particular setback is the starting point sure <clears throat> I believe that uh, I'm a fan of consistency as well so I think when someone and the neighbors purchased their lots they assumed there was going to be some distance from the lot line and I think we should stick with with that and if there's room to put an auxiliary dwelling unit in there and stick with that, then, then that's good. The other thing from, from the discussion I wanted to point out is when, when I hear attached auxiliary dwelling unit, I don't consider that an auxiliary dwelling unit. Mm. I think of that just as a home expansion. So I wonder if in the language of the zone and we define an ADU as being detached, just to clarify that point. As well. But couldn't you do a detached and have a separate entrance? Um, when I've gone up to Sedona, yeah. you know, they have separate entrances um, that are, you know, the basement's finished or mm -hmm. it's on the side. So it's attached, but there's a separate, I don't know if we can qualify by entry point or something. I, I think if it's part of the original structure, if it's expanded, then in my book, that's just adding a room to a house it's not really an auxiliary dwelling unit from my perspective so you don't see a difference if there's a separate entrance that they could no. use it okay yeah right if it's detached that that's the way i feel should be an auxiliary right. dwelling unit. well it could have changed the footprint because you know if you did a, a under the patio you could go under the patio and go out further as well mm -hmm. um mr miramontes i agree with councilmember brocco and just having consistent Consistency across the board would be great, and I think five foot is real close. But whatever the developer decides, you know, will ultimately be the decision. But I think five foot is close. Right, Smeter. Um, I don't think five foot is close. <laughs> <laughs> I build a lot of uh, accessory structures, and um, you, you're you're talking about taking away a whole revenue stream, um, tax dollars, um, and stuff uh, to uh, a group of people. And, and even the possibilities of, of the development of the homes and uh, stuff. So I, I, I think that it's, 
that part uh, accessory structure should be able to stay at five feet. Okay. Yeah. And and and, Mr. Mayor, a lot of our existing neighborhoods already you, are at five, are five feet. foot. You go to the wall to your end to, your, to the side of your house, and you're you're about five feet right there now. Right. Well, but I'm, see, there is I, a difference on if I purchase a home that has a five foot back versus I've already purchased a home and my neighbor decides to build a secondary home behind my in my front yard or my backyard, which now brings it much closer did, than did it was Did he come before. over your side of the wall? No, no, no what I'm then saying- Then it's not your problem. No, what people purchase homes with set backs that they're like, I know I'm this far away from that person's home and they build it based on that space. People buy homes based on that space. I am if, not, if Brocco, you, hold if, on. Yeah. I am not stating that we should limit ADUs at all. I'm saying we need to limit how close they are that affects the quality of life to the neighbors next door. If you wanted more property, you should have got a bigger lot. Now, I think I know where both of you stand. Uh, uh, you know, so I, I do have a comment on that. And, and we get a lot of individuals that show up to these planning and zoning commissions that are neighbors. And so I, I think um, you know, Vice Mayor Egbert is saying exactly what they would feel is that they had some assumptions when they purchased the lot of what their neighbor's um, property was going to look like next to them. Right. And so I, I don't think we should change those assumptions. Whatever the existing setbacks are, we should continue to, you know, um, protect those right. you know, and, and not shorten the amount. If it's 10 feet, don't make it five feet. Right, but if it's 10, whether it's an ADU or not, right. you know, then we're good with it. But right. that's like kind of Mayor the discussion. Mayor Murphy, I wanted yeah. to jump in just for a minute here sure. and explain where we came up with the five feet that's being shown on here. And that's because that is the setback that is currently for any other type of accessory structure. So if you build a shed or a ramada or a hobby room or anything else in your backyard, we took those same setbacks and applied them to the accessory dwelling unit. So the question then for the council is, when you're looking at setbacks for these structures, do you want to differentiate between a living space versus some other sort of space? Right. So I could, I, could, I could build a shed technically as large as that building on the left with a five-foot setback. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, well, uh, Diane, you go first, then I'll go back to Councilmember Gillespie, and then I'll go and get the other two. Uh, Councilmember Priello. So I'm feeling simpatico with the vice mayor, and I, I can't put my irrigation system, it has to be five feet from the wall. I can't imagine an ADU that could be up to a thousand square feet. Uh, within a space and looking like that. And that's when you're on the other side of the wall, that's what you see. I, I appreciate what you said, uh, Anna, that the, the, the standard was the same as a, a shed. And there's a big difference between a shed and a thousand foot ADU. Yes, and another family. Um, and also, um, with the business of an ADU being attached, is that the concept that Lanier did when it builds their Gen X homes? Because I've been in them where it's a self-contained unit with a separate unit, a separate entrance, and it's its own little separate little house inside a larger house. Is that an ADU or is that just a home that was built that way? So I can respond to that, Mayor Murphy, yep. members of the council, members of the commission. The Lennar homes that are the next gen style, the what we're calling the ADU in this conversation right now is actually not an ADU because it doesn't have a full kitchen. The way mm. that we differentiate the second dwelling unit is by the presence of a kitchen. So when you go through those models, they'll usually show them with a toaster oven and a hot plate. Correct. So when you don't put that stove or the oven in there, it is not considered a separate dwelling, and therefore they, they, the ones I've been in have had an entryway between that accessory unit and the main unit, and that's how they're able to call it a single dwelling. So Anna, if we, did, if we approved whatever version of this, could the next next-gen house be built with a kitchen inside the next-gen house? Yes. Okay. And an outside entrance, because I have been in one, I looked at them, where you had an outside entrance, right. your own special entrance, but you also have a door in that goes to the kitchen right. of the main house, but there was no kitchen. I mean, they were tiny, they were really tiny. What would happen if the, someone talked about a lot that was 9,000 feet, because I'm with you, May. I, I had thought of 
a, a thousand foot building five feet from the back wall and that poor person that bought the house or even to each side, I'd be having a cow. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference be in my mind between uh, an ADU and uh, a utility shed. Uh, Mayor yes. and Council, yes. so just, just to piggyback on that question or, or in part respond to it, um, if in that instance that same property owner was able to go to Home Depot and purchase a 1,500 square foot shed to build and put in their backyard and it only had a five foot setback requirement, what's the difference between a 1,500 square foot shed and a 1,000 square foot ADU? In other communities that, that I'm familiar with and have experience in, the way that they dealt with this issue is that that ADU could not have any windows or doors facing into the, you know, facing the neighbor's side. Uh, it had to it had to face the home um, that that it was a accessory to, um, and that's one way they they made the differentiation the, the differentiation because in reality that same property owner could go in and, and go to Home Depot and purchase that 1,500 square foot shed and build it in the backyard with no issue at all. Right. Um, I also would, getting back to the accessory dwelling unit that um, is actually under the same roof, I know, I know there was a recommendation to, hey, don't consider that an accessory dwelling unit, but we have to remember that um, we're adding a place of residence right. to additional population in our community, and it's a different type of use. Mm -hmm. And so um, it helps the municipality also to track how many percentage of your properties have ADUs when they're forced and considered ADU. So even if it's even if it's within the same roof, for instance, you have a home and they have an ability to have a separate parking, you know, spot for an ADU and they convert part of their basement with a separate door. It's all under the same footprint, but there's a studio apartment in the basement and it's considered an ADU and that's really important for a community to be able to track that use because it, it means something down the road in terms of regulation. Sometimes, sometimes that has an impact, a negative impact or a positive impact on a neighborhood and you wanna be able to track it and know what's happening. Would it affect like state shared revenue and such if someone was living there, do we track? It, it, could, it could affect census counts, right. it could affect state shared revenue, it could affect quality of life. We just wanna be able to maintain an understanding of what's happening in the community and so I I would argue that there's a lot more to it and an importance of keeping those tracked as ADUs even if it's under one rooftop um, than to just say it's only an ADU if it's detached right because I, there's Mr. more Mayor. to it than just that uh, thank well, you just let me, let me go um, finish okay he had a question I wanted to answer what's the difference I wanted to answer his question whose question Shane Shane's? what's the difference between a shed and a home so he asked that question I wanted to answer it that's why I'm okay can you hold that and yeah, then that's fine um, Debbie I haven't heard from you at all <laughs> yes I do I do <laughs> that's why it's a study session we hear from everybody you know when, when they say five foot setback it's five feet and five feet so there's really ten feet between the two structures um, is that better? Is that go better? go go closer to it is that better? no try to the other the other way Nope. Nope. <laughs> Yell really loud. Maybe Simons will pick it up. No? Okay. Yep, there you go. What'd you do? <laughs> um, I, I like the idea of the ADUs because I have a daughter who's impaired that will probably live with me for the rest of her life, and that's what we're looking into. It's not going to happen in Rancho Saurita where I live because I don't have any room anyway for it. Um, so we are looking, you know, to be able to build where we can build her a structure also. And I think there's a lot of people out there that need that. They've got their parents living with them. Um, they've got nieces and nephews living with them. Some of them have their adult children living with them because they can't afford to go out and get their own uh, apartment or house. So I'm all for it. Um, you know, I was going to bring up that same point that Shane did. What's the difference between a shed and uh, and an ADU? You know, with the shed, kids go out there and put their music on full blast, um, just like they would in a house. Right. Thank you, Simon. 
I think at this point I'll hold my comments, but uh, again, we're trying to simplify the code here, or right. simplify it, um, and I think that's what we need to keep in focus here. Okay. You know, the, the details on the setbacks and things like that, I think that'll come, come out in the wash, but we're trying to simplify things, and I guess the end result is to make more living spaces available in the town, right. and to address a lot of issues we're seeing out there with folks needing places to live. Dr. Gillespie? <laughs> you know I was coming to you. I'm glad you came to me. Um, I do have some thoughts. Um, I think if we keep the setbacks uh, for the ADUs as the same as the living spaces that are already established, I think that would be fine. I, I, I'm okay with the ADUs, but let's just keep it the same setbacks. Okay, I'll have a comment on that. Vice Mayor and then Council Member Priel. I wanted to ask, answer Shane's question about what's the difference between a shed and a home. Um, first of all, parking, more parking pe people, there'd be more people, more traffic, um, more family, more people on that small space right there, um, less yard and able for those people that you're putting more people on a smaller space for usage of their yards. Um, also, if you can imagine putting six of those houses right next to each other that are already the setbacks between the two homes is small between them, and now you're adding less and less space. We are no longer the town of Sarita that we are used to with space and living in a suburban area. We have become an urban community. When you have this many areas packed full of buildings, we have now turned ourselves into something completely different than what we started with here in town of Sarita. We are now urbanizing, urbanizing our community, which we have to remember the reason why people move to Sarita is so they don't have to live in Tucson. Uh, Councilman Priel. We need more living space for folks. Uh, I, I know that very clearly. Uh, I'm a visual person, and I would appreciate it if I could see visually some of the things that you were talking about, Shane. If, if an ADU could be attached or under a roof or over a garage, I need to wrap my mind around that to see it, whether that would solve the problem of you needing a space for a disabled family member, yet at the same time maintaining a, the, the look and having space in a backyard, or does the lot need to be bigger? I, I don't know what the difference between 9,000 and 8,000 looks like and how much of a difference that makes, but I need more information because I'm in faith. I, I, I know we need more living space and I'd want to be supportive of situations like yours and yours for sure. But I'm also concerned, I share some of your concerns, the Vice Mayor's concerns. Mr. Maynard. Uh, my question is for Dylan. Um, just like when we submit uh, an application for modification of setback, uh, you generate a list of addresses and the neighbors have to sign off on that project. Would an ADU uh, uh, be the same kind of process since it's uh, an additional dwelling going in on that property? Would the neighbors have to sign off on that? So if a uh, vice mayor uh, lived next door to that person and she didn't agree with it, she can say no. So as far as, if you're asking if an ADU went in and met the setbacks that we currently have proposed, then no, it would not be a process of getting the neighbor signatures. If they were to encroach into those setbacks, then they would go through a modification of setback process, as you mentioned. So it sounds like if it's five feet and they're within, outside of the five feet, they wouldn't have to. But I mean, that's something that potentially could be considered um, from that perspective. So Shane and Anna, you've heard a lot of um, discussion and I don't know, it's, yeah, Chair. So just, just one other thing that's kind of been danced around but hasn't been said. I, I think the Vice Mayor and myself were concerned about residents enjoying the property they've bought and not changing the game. Right. But what staff shared with us is if these setbacks are the way they are now in the current code, is the game really changing? It, it's kind of consistent as it is. Right. Just to kind of throw a little wrench in there. Right. So, so I want to just yeah. call that out. Uh, yeah, I guess other than what the vice mayor brought up, there's someone actually living in that shed that's approved now, but the shed could literally be larger t today than the home ADU could be in the future. Would the setbacks currently before these changes be five feet for a casita? 
uh, Chairman Backer. I would have to look at that. I can <coughs> probably get that information before the end of the, the meeting. Shane? It's, yeah. Well, first of all, I think we could probably be going all night on this so, without getting a resolution. What I'm struggling with is how do we get a consensus when... Um, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if um, I'll let Ella and if field part of this one, but um, I, I think it's difficult to get consensus until you actually see, you know, a, a policy or code in front of you. Right. And so we can take this feedback and we can generate, you know, a a policy document for you to look at and kind of, you know, mull over, mull over, over and 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 work and massage. And maybe have until some vi visuals as Council Member Priolo had. And absolutely, we can we can show some visuals, some more visuals. These are great visuals, but they're limited in that they're only showing detached and not what an attached looks like. Right. And that one or has actually, windows, or that. actually an ADU within, right? right. Um, I will I will let you know that I think I th you know if if you have if you have this thought that. A you know a 500 square foot or a thousand square foot ADU is going to bring um, you know a big family presence. Um, it, it's not been my experience that that's what a, is attracted to ADUs. What's attracted to ADUs is um, a, a mother's quarter, right? Where you got a, a mom that needs caring or a loved one that needs caring. Um, the um, the the maybe the young married couple that's trying to get started and they can't afford you know their own home kind of thing and so they'll they'll move in and usually by the time they have their first kid um, they're already outgrown a, a thousand square foot you know unit I'm just talking realistic in terms of what those demographics really really mean right. and that are attracted to these types of uh, entities so um, I think there's ways to address um, protecting neighbors I mean if if this community is okay with a 1,500 square foot shed being built on the five, uh, you know, on the five foot, foot setback, setback. Um, it's hard to argue that you're not okay with an ADU being constructed that's either that size or smaller. And we're talking smaller than that here in these right. instances. The way you protect neighbors is that you make sure that there's no windows to look over into somebody else's backyard. You you make those types of standards in place to protect neighbor. Um, but if you're concerned about a structure being constructed at the five foot setback that's that big, then we probably ought to be having a bigger discussion about what we allow to be built there, period. Because, I mean, like I said, a structure is a structure is a structure. Right. Um, the, 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 the issue about adding people, that's exactly what ADUs do. Um, there is going to be, you know, a, you know, how do we address the parking requirement? I don't, we haven't even talked about parking tonight right. yet um, mm -hmm. but you know there's on-street parking considerations there's there's you know you're required to provide on-site parking you know that's a big um, hindrance sometimes to a property owner where do I find that parking um, some of these things might kind of govern themselves I mean if you if you can't provide parking maybe you you shouldn't be in the business of, of getting into an ADU in the first right. place so I think we can take this collective feedback we can actually generate a document for you to look at and highlight the, the decision points and come back for uh, another round. Thank you. And that could even include if you're within five feet, um, you know, maybe the ADU can only be X, which would by its limit of size limit the people that actually live there. And if you were 10 feet back on an ADU, then it could be potentially larger where you would have potentially more people. I mean, just, just as an example. Of Mr. So. Mayor, I just wanted to add that um, Mr. Dilley did just said, you know, young families, mother-in-law stuff, but it's also potential rental rentals, VRBOs, short-term rentals, where there could be a very different group of people there on a regular basis throughout the year. The neighbors have no idea who's living across just five feet away from them, and it could be a party every Saturday night if it's a, a that type of rental. And so I just want to make sure, yes, I think they're mother-in-laws, and yes, I think we should have these opportunities. I just think it needs to be a bigger square foot lot and it needs to be further away from the neighbors and they can think, I oh, oh I'm sorry can I say something yes. Mayor? um to your point there's houses now where people are renting out their bedrooms no. to other people so you're having you have a four bedroom house and they rent three more house three more people that's three more cars I'm, I'm talking about space and the, and the closeness to but I think well one thing I think we've learned that there's 
a difference of opinion, and there needs to be probably more study um, on this, okay. which will probably... But, but f five feet does not allow me to know or not know my neighbor. I not know my neighbors by choice. Right. right. So it doesn't matter how close they are to me. <laughs> Well, it, it, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, well, that's the issue in, in general because you could have one family structure home where it's horrible. You as a realtor know that, right? You're, you're, you're wrestling with that without an ADU or without anything else. Um, so it's really hard to, um, I think, deal with all those issues because um, they tend to be one-off in a lot of cases. But um, Dylan... I don't think you even finished your presentation, did you? So why don't you, we'll, we'll pause now, let you finish. Maybe we can wrap up some, I know you've heard a lot, maybe a little bit more will come from it, but please finish and then we'll figure out where to go from there. Okay, Mayor Murphy, members of the council, Chairman Backer, members of the commission. I did wanna get back to Chairman Backer's question real quick. And that setback for um, guest houses currently in our code is 20 feet. <clears throat> So the one of the other options we were looking at is the single family. Consistency is incredible. The single family for rent communities, and these are uh, basically treated similar to an apartment complex. So it's one property with a number of single family homes on it, and it's managed by one entity. And in order to allow this in the code, we just had to change the multifamily definition to allow for multiple single family homes on one lot. The uh, third thing we looked at was that for tiny homes. And um, so we did provide rules for tiny homes. And at the last meeting, there was a lot of discussion uh, about the tiny home regulations that we had proposed. Uh, based on the feedback we did receive from the public, we didn't make any changes to those proposals. There, there was definitely a lot of uh, discussion regarding the tiny homes on wheels setback that we established. Um, but again, it was definitely an area of concern from the public that we did, did hear about, so we didn't make any changes to that. So that's a 100-foot setback to have a tiny home? Uh, that's a tiny home on wheels. So for the, if it's built on site, it's permitted in any residential zone as a main house. If it's uh, pre-manufactured and brought on site, it's permitted where manufactured homes would be permitted. And those are typically your three quarters of an acre lots or larger. And then those with wheels are permitted on those same larger lots, but with a 100 foot setback. And this would not apply to your tiny home villages. Your tiny home villages are permitted in the MH zone, or the, what will be the new MH zone. Currently so it's a TH zone. How does that fit with the, uh, a trailer then? So it, yeah, if, if it's registered as a motor vehicle in a tiny home, then it, this would not apply. It would be treated as an RV. If it's not, if it's not uh, registered as a motor vehicle, then that would be the setback. That applies. How did they get it there on wheels if it's not registered as a motor vehicle? They tow it. The trailer. They tow it. Well, that's what, that's what I'm kind of saying. Is it the same as a trailer? Are the rules the same if I took a little Airstream oh. as opposed to a tiny home on wheels? Again, I'm looking at consistency. So could you answer that, Dylan? If it was an airstream that was towed in, what would be the, what, you know, a fifth wheel? Right. So currently, though, the way that our code is, if it's a, um, I guess, an airstream or um, park models, those type of things, those are allowed only in the manufactured house zone. Okay. And this would be the ex this would be the exception. A tiny home. Cor would correct. Okay. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> it should be consistent. Right. I mean, you change the you change shakes to uh, aluminum, and all of a sudden it's a different animal. Right. <laughs> the outside, yeah. Because yeah, yes. Uh, I feel compelled to ask this. It probably sounds like a stupid question, but if you've got a tiny home on wheels and you remove the wheels, does it become an ADU? Dylan? So that if it, basically that's typically where the pre-manufacturer would come in. So you would take off the wheels and set it on the ground, and then it would be permitted in those same larger lot zones. It just wouldn't have the same setback. 
The setback is just basically put in there for the aesthetics reasons. Right. But it has to be set, right? If yeah, if it's taken correct. If it's yeah. taken off the wheels. That's Usually the set. set is anchored it'd be, it'd be right on. Set. Yeah. Correct. Just taking the wheels won't qualify it, but right. <laughs> <laughs> two two jacks and a, a thing it don't work, right? Continue, Dylan, sorry. And then as far as tiny homes as accessory dwelling units, um, in the RH and GR1 zones, uh, the tiny homes on wheels and pre-manufactured tiny homes would be permitted. Um, in the SR, R1, and R2 zones, the tiny homes on wheels and pre-manufactured tiny homes are permitted with an approved type one conditional use permit and some additional restrictions as far as uh, screening of the tiny home. And that's mainly that it's in like a, a walled in rear yard. The only exception to that is the SR where they are larger lots. So we've, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be walled in, but some sort of visual screening. And then if they are built on site, they'd be allowed anywhere that ADUs are allowed. Right. Because a stick built tiny home is a small home, Correct. basically, right? There's no difference. It's a shed. It. It's a shed <laughs> with a kitchen. The, uh, the last thing we looked at was the small lot detached home subdivision. And in order to do this, we basically are just reducing the minimum lot size for single detached units in the multifamily zones, which is the R4 and R5. So we're reducing those to match what's already allowed for uh, duplexes or multifamily homes in those zones. So it doesn't increase the density, it just allows the single family product to be built at the same density as the multifamily. Right, and that would be everybody that would buy. We'd know, you know, it's a separate discussion I think we've had previously. This is how it was designed to be. You're buying in there knowing it and all of the above. That's correct. And then again, as we kind of went over earlier, this is the areas of the town that it would impact. It wouldn't apply to Rancho Sarita. It would not for the most part would not apply to the other specific planned communities, but it would apply to all other areas of the town, except where the CCNRs would limit those. Right. And then as far as the next steps, um, well, uh, originally that we were tentatively thinking April 3rd for the Planning and Zoning Commission. Yes. I think with the feedback tonight, we'll probably be pushing that back. And yes. then also uh, based on when we hold that meeting, we'll schedule a town council meeting after that. And then, so basically, we've received a lot of feedback tonight. One of the other areas, as uh, the town manager was referencing, is we were looking for feedback on parking requirements for accessory dwelling units. And when you look at most of the literature on it, it they basically, requiring parking is looked as a, as a deterrent to people being able to build ADUs whether it's a physical uh, issue of them being able to fit one on the lot or uh, cost prohibitive. Um, but we did receive, obviously, some concern from the public. So some of the things we had talked about was if the, the lots with a smaller width, whether or not we would require those ones to, to uh, have to have a, a parking spot on site. And also in areas where there is no street parking, obviously, we uh, could require uh, a parking spot for the ADU. No, I know parking would be a big deal in some areas, um, only because we struggle with on-street parking and all those types of things, because no one has storage, so storage is in the garage and the cars are outside. So I'd want, I guess, a little bit more understanding um, from the parking perspective, because we already struggle with that. Um, but you really don't want more feedback, do you, tonight? <laughs> Right. Dr. Gillespie, I think you had a question or a comment. Yeah, I, I think it'd be reasonable to say you need to provide parking on your lot for it. And if you don't have room for the parking, you might not have room for the accessory dwelling unit. And I'll just, um, good point. I guess I'll counter a little bit because I go back to daughter or my mom if she was living with me. Um, she wouldn't be driving, so she wouldn't need a car, but good point, but that's some of the things we need to flesh out on um, uh, where, where we land, I guess, at the end of the day. Uh, wait, uh, 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 Com Council Member Priolo and then Barco. So I don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot by requiring a lot big enough for an ADU and a parking space because that's defeating the whole purpose. We're trying to be more flexible to allow more opportunity 
for housing to expand in our town that's more affordable for folks and helps families that have needs with relatives. Um, so the people that made the comments, I mean, only 45 people responded. Were they from Rancho Saharita? I mean, because they wouldn't be allowed there. And the areas where these ADUs could be allowed are small, narrow streets with lots of cars and trucks and like what you see in Rancho parked up on the sidewalk almost. Is that a current problem? Councilmember Priolo, the people that uh, that did um, speak on this issue and were concerned about the parking, they were not from Rancho Sarita. They were actually from areas that the ADUs would be allowed. So some of the older areas off of La Cunada, and specifically some of those that had, um, I guess, alleys that run adjacent to the to properties, and they were very concerned with the parking. Councilmember Bracco. It, this is an overall comment. In general, you know, I'm a big fan of simplification of right. codes and making it so anybody can pick it up and figure out what it is they're supposed to do. One of the problems we get into is tunnel vision. We're looking at a, a, a tiny house on wheels. To me, it was a trailer, mm -hmm. okay? But we look at a trailer completely different. No, if you're going to simplify, you've got to look at second and third level effects of what you're changing here to cons make it consistent throughout. Otherwise, you just add levels of complexity. Even though you simplified one thing, you made more complex. Right. Or if you're going to buy a tiny home with wheels and that's not permitted, I go buy an Airstream Bingo. and I circumvent the process, which isn't. Um, I'd love to hear your comment, uh, Mr. Mayor, because I know you have a rather big property, especially on the parking part. Kind of, could you wait, just weigh in on your thoughts on there? Because um, you'd be one my, of these people. My first home was in Rancho, and I don't know how many times the neighbors parked in front of my mailbox and I didn't get mail. And being a business, that's very frustrating. Um, that's why I moved out of Rancho, and to find a property that could suit my business and my needs in the future. Um, my, if I put a uh, ADU on my property, I'll be able to support uh, any parking Park, any on parking. the property. Um, I have three and a half acres where right. we're at now. So it's kind of probably two issues. It's the smaller lots and, uh, well, not in Rancho specifically because they're not allowed there, but another potential like that. I don't we, know. We do also own a, um, a rental property in Green Valley. And we find that most of the Airbnb and the VRBO tenants are either coming to visit family a week, two weeks, or they're coming out to experience Green Valley and Sarita because they're thinking of retiring down here. Right. So that, that's the majority uh, of uh, the people yeah. that we get. Or, and then we get that last little bit are coming out for work. They're not coming for the Green Valley party scene? <laughs> when, the mountains, when the mountains turn pink, it's time to drink. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and, and I, I could see that very different than a Sedona, where most of your VRBOs and uh, Airbnbs are tourist partiers, um, those kinds of things mm -hmm. um, on there. That, that's a great point. Um, on there. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I have one thing. It's not a question. It's actually um, a thank you. Um, Anna, you mentioned these pop-up um, meetings that you had at the budget, um, strategic budget, budget, whatever retreat we had, and I was very impressed with your innovative decision on how to get out to the community about this, and I was very impressed with um, whoever came up with that idea. Congratulations, I think that was a spectacular idea and the fact that um, if it wasn't you, that you supported it, encouraged it, and brought it to the public. I think that is the way to reach out to the residents is those type of things, so thank you. And was there, because I also had appreciation for reaching out early to MPA and Saba, because you know those are the two sister organizations that basically help us over the years. Did they weigh in on any of this discussion? <laughs> On the report on where some did any of these particular concerns that were expressed tonight kind of come up from them in the beginning yes that's a great question mayor murphy members of the council we interacted with them before we brought this out to the general public so some of their concerns that they had had already been addressed before we had the draft ready for the public to see and for all of you to see one of the things that we talked about a lot with saba was the minimum lot sizes and the yep. densities they had an interest in the smaller lot communities that we talked about where we're looking at dropping the density for the detached units to, to match what's allowed for multifamily. Um, 
They also had some comments about accessory dwelling units that we took into consideration. I have kept both Saba and MPA up to date on this process as we've been going through. I attend Saba's technical committee meeting monthly and I've provided them with several updates. And the MPA also has a public policy committee that I have been keeping up to date on all of this. And they've been generally very supportive of the changes. Thank you. There's just a comment I wanted to hear. Um, do you think, Shane, do you think there is, have all of you heard enough that um, I'm guessing we will probably have to push, I would say, you know, push it. It's not, uh, you know, I think it's important to do, but I think it's important to do right and we don't have a lot of development looking at this, but I'd love to be prepared if they come to us. Do you have enough as a as staff to do another shot at this and bring it back to us? Yes, Mayor Murphy, what I'm hearing is that we need to do another joint study session. <laughs> so what I'd like to do with the next study session, if Shane and the Council and Commission are amenable, is to really drill down on just a couple of the issues instead of doing the broader overview and present a few different options of actual how the zoning would be written and what what those changes would look like on the ground. And we can try and get Dylan doing some more modeling, which I was really impressed with, and just try out a few different things and see where we all fall on it. Okay, thank you. Shane, are you comfortable with that? Where we are ab now? Absolutely, I think that is definitely our next step. Um, I would uh, I would ask uh, Anna if, if, uh, if we can also look at um, what our codes permit or do not permit by way of a property owner adding on-site parking to their, you know, to their, um, their current footprint. Sometimes there's restrictions on, you know, what you can do outside of the, 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 the driveway to your garage. Right. And if there's other considerations, um, that might be helpful too when we come back to council. Sure. The issues that I'm taking note of that I think we need to discuss further are ADUs, whether the detached or the attached, and how that impacts setbacks, and then just the setbacks in general for the ADUs, and also the parking issues. Yeah. Inconsistency, um, just in general. Right. You and know, and we can Brocco. also take another look at the commentary that we've been hearing about the trailers versus the tiny homes on wheels and right. how those are registered. There's a difference in the way that they're built. The trailers are built to a vehicle standard where something that's built to a manufactured home standard is registered not through the motor vehicle department but through the housing department. So we can get you some more of those details and help bring a better understanding on that topic yep. as well. And especially on the tiny homes, if it's on wheels, it's X, but if you built that exact same standard on the ground to begin with, it seems like we're falling in a whole different category, which kind of doesn't make sense to me. Yes. Also, considerations for homes that do have the, uh, like the mother-in-law suite, the right. next-gen home for Lennar. Uh, I own the home that's a Lennar, and I have my mother-in-law living in there now. And I also have my stepson that got out of the Army his daughter and his wife live with us as well right now until they find um, their home. Right. So I have both situations happening, but it says it doesn't apply to Rancho Sarita, but what about it's already a home that's already built, it has everything, all I'd, all I'd have to do is put a kitchen in there right. and possibly put a parking space. Right. I guess probably to touch on, probably a, a drill down I'd say a little bit more on where exactly in the community this would apply to and not apply to and how that would affect you know, Mr. Maramontes' home in Rancho as opposed to, uh, you know, because we don't have that many. We have Quail Creek, Stonehouse, Madeira Highlands, Los Arroyos. So I think kind of drilling down on what footprint in the town this is actually affecting or could affect, I think would be important as well. Mayor, yes. Council, I also heard a little bit about maybe Maybe, maybe we haven't quite hit the sweet spot on the size of lot right. that this is permitted on. So maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll just jump back into that one just a little bit and see if we can get the council and the, and the commission to a point where you're more comfortable with the lot size. Maybe 8,000 square feet just wasn't quite there. Right. Um, I kind of got that sense as well. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take another stab at it. Okay, thanks. Yes, Chair. I, I did have one question. <clears throat> the, the 
the was it the the single layer uh, high density homes uh, built to rent or, or whatever that category was when i see those i think of townhomes and condos it's not clear to me how those are different from condos and townhomes so okay. at some point i'd like to understand that a little better yep we can we'll add that to our one of our next three study sessions now <laughs> being optimistic I know. I love this, actually. Yes. I have a request. Could you do me up a map of the town and show me the areas where these ADUs may, where the lots will be, or the areas would be where these ADUs could, could potentially go? I'd like to drive around and see with my own eyes. I need to do, like, boots on the ground. Yep. Back to that. Uh, thank you. Um, if you have no further questions, do you want to adjourn your meeting and then we'll move on? But really, thank you for, oh, one more question. Not a question, but you know, I dealt with uh, um, planning and zoning uh, for a while and the setbacks have been consistent. Anything attached, uh, 10 foot from the back of the property line, five on the sides. Any accessory uh, dwelling or uh, shade units, um, five foot, five foot to the rear, five foot to the back, or as little as three, depending on the model plan. But it's been consistent. Right. Yeah, I, I think and, that's... And I, and, and I think if we start treating uh, these units as if it's an attached unit and give them the same setbacks, um, I, I just don't think that's going to be the way to go. Yeah, no, I think we have more due I, diligence. Whoa. I just want to counter. I think there, there's, I think there's competing interests here. There's the property owner and then there's the adjacent neighbors. Right. And they're always going to be like that tension of, okay, um, you built a shed. I understand normally what a shed and I can put up with a shed. Those are certain existing setbacks. Uh, but when you have people living, mm -hmm. you have kitchens, toiletry, you have people all the time in the house, may even hear you know, more than just a loud occasional party. You'll hear them every day. So I, I think we really need to distinguish that these ADUs are living spaces. They're mm -hmm. not sheds. There's a difference between a, a living unit and a shed. Right. And those setbacks should be considered to be different. Okay. Good, good input. Dr. Gillespie? Holy smokes. Uh, Mr. Mellett just said exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> well, that'll shorten the meeting. Thank you. Uh, any other comments before we adjourn? This part. Uh, Chair? All right. Uh, do I need a motion to adjourn this part? Mm, no, I don't think so. Okay. You, then hereby count it adjourned. Then. Thank you for your attendance and your volunteerism and all of your input. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, we're to item number 13, which I'm assuming is going to be a little shorter, Mr. Gonzalez. But please read. That Discussion part. and possible approval of contract number 230040 with TIP Strategies Incorporated for the development and implementation of an economic development master plan commencing February 27th, 2023 and terminating December 31st, 2023 in an amount not to exceed $150,000. Thank you. Victor Gonzalez, our Economic Development and Public Affairs Director. Uh, we'll be presenting a leading discussion. Thank you, Victor. Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm all for uh, prohibiting the mother-in-law to stay too long. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, your comment was supposed to be before. You can't yeah. add to anything. <laughs> and my mother-in-law's not here in this meeting as well. You're only allowed to put them under the stairs, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, I just wanted to uh, take just a moment to introduce this item before you. It's a contract. Uh, typically, these contracts are in consent but we felt it was a good opportunity to do uh, just a general overview of our previous efforts as it relates to economic development uh, strategic planning, uh, the results of that, and also where we're going with this new contract. So just want to speak uh, a little bit about the benefits of strategic planning and the process of, I won't spend too much time on this slide, but I do want to point out that there's a number of, of benefits to going through this process. We did so back in 2015, 2016. Uh, but overall, I, I would say that the benefits in itself is really gives us an opportunity to define who we are as a community. Uh, and uh, I'll speak to on the next slide as to uh, what that process looked like back in 2015, 2016 and the results of that. 
but also it gives us uh, an opportunity to really lay a foundation for effective and practical economic development efforts. So uh, communities that do not go through this process, many times they're just shooting in the dark as to uh, what they want to be, what they want to attract, uh, efforts and programs and activities uh, that many times uh, don't result uh, and are not fruitful. Uh, the benefits of going through an economic development planning process also uh, provides you uh, an ability to uh, create consensus as well uh, and uh, be able to develop mutually acceptable goals and really a common agenda around economic development. Uh, when you think about economic development as a footnote, it equals many things to many people. Um, so one may think economic development is solely about attraction. Others may think about economic development solely about entrepreneurship and small business development. Others may think that economic development has to do with policy, uh, whether it's, it's zoning, code, and so on and so forth. And so uh, it provides us a common goal and vision when we go through this planning process. And ultimately, it provides us a, uh, a realistic assessment, and that realistic assessment is balanced with uh, the vision and the goals that we want to go for economic development. So back in 2015, uh, 2016, we went through uh, what is now the Blueprint for Economic Growth and Prosperity. That was the name of the economic development plan. And what you see on the slide is really six key strategies, overarching strategies that were defined in the economic development plan uh, back then. I won't spent a whole lot of time going through each of these, but I do want to touch a little bit about how these strategies that we all defined led us to uh, the success that we have now. Uh, uh, to give you some context, there was about over 110 individual stakeholders and focus groups uh, that weighed into the economic development, plan, economic development plan. We also had uh, an industry cluster analysis report, looked at our industry and what's compatible and uh, the types of industries that we can attract. It also looked at our comparative, uh, comparative analysis, uh, analysis and our competitive advantages and so on and so forth. So of, these, uh, of, of all that information that was gathered, uh, a number of strategies were, were put together and, and here on the slide uh, there are six that really stood out uh, from that plan. Uh, the first one was to really sustain and strengthen our assets and our advantages. Again, that was based on the SWOT analysis that was conducted at the time and the feedback that was given to the consultant. And, and, and ultimately, it's let's build on those assets, let's build on the advantages that we have. Uh, and I, I truly believe that, you know, that led to us really focusing and leveraging uh, the residential growth, right? On one hand, Yes, we consider, and rightly so, we may still be considered as a bedroom community, but we took the strength as a bedroom community, the residential growth and the development activity, and we turned that into commercial development opportunities that resulted into uh, the crossings uh, where we now have Sprouts, TJ Maxx, that led to a new hospital being developed, uh, and also, you know, enhancing uh, parks and recreation program because uh, that's an economic development activity in itself. So, you know, that strategy was how do we leverage the assets? How do we uh, take advantage of the resources we have and generate economic development? I think we've done that very well over the last several years. Uh, the second uh, strategy that was identified back in 2016 uh, was about uh, developing our capacity, uh, but also accommodating economic development. Uh, we've, we've grown, I believe, as a department, but we've also grown in how we align ourselves with our partners uh, locally, regional, and statewide. Uh, so uh, back in 2015, 2016, we did not have a formal agreement with the Green Valley Sahuita Chamber of Commerce. Now we do, and we have had uh, some fruitful, fruitful results. Uh, we also have better alignment with organizations like Sun Corridor, uh, Pima County Economic Development, and at the state level with Arizona Commerce Authority. And so that was a strategy that we knew we had to implement back then, and we've done so successfully over the last several years. Uh, number three is really about how uh, we retain and grow existing economic drivers. And 
Uh, that's about how we interact with local industry, and I think we have stronger relationships now with, with our industry partners over the last several years and since we've implemented this strategy. It goes without saying, one of the strategies was to invest in uh, and strengthen employment and business centers. Just one word, SAMTEC. That's all we have to say and think about uh, that demonstrates that investment that we've made uh, and that strategy that we implemented from the economic development plan. And, you know, over the years, uh, I'm proud to say that as an organization, uh, your leadership, we've elevated the identity of the community and the profile within the economic development arena, uh, which led us to having great success and the attraction of what is um, uh, power photonics and steel Jupiter. Uh, you know, the first type of projects uh, that this community has attracted, and I believe we can do so more in the future. So I want to just give you a sample of what the master planning set process will look like uh, if this contract is approved tonight. Uh, there'll be a similar engagement process early on in which uh, the consultant uh, has proposed uh, to set up uh, the project and its stakeholder engagement. Uh, and so uh, very much like we did back in 2015, 2016, uh, it's still very much important to engage uh, at the local level, local level, regional and state. And so you'll very much have an input to the process as well as our stakeholders and partners. Uh, we still, we, we feel that uh, once again, we need to assess ourselves economically and how do we compare to other regions to establish our competitive edge but also to identify areas of weaknesses and opportunities that we might have. Um, I do believe it's time to look at our uh, industries. Uh, yes, there are industries that are still relevant, like mining, aerospace and defense, and others, but we know that there are new emerging industries uh, that uh, were not so relevant back in 2015, 2016, and so looking again at where we're at as a community and how we uh, may be able to complement some of these new industries that are coming to play. Best practices is a new, uh, a fairly new area that we'll have the uh, consultant focus on, uh, and that is going to be really three different areas of best practices. The first one is going to be real estate acquisition and development. And so, uh, you know, looking at uh, what we've done in the past with SamTech. And although uh, we're not in the business of developing real estate, uh, we can certainly have uh, a role as we move into the future as to how we um, develop uh, sites, whether it's through regulatory process or infrastructure uh, that allows those sites to be shovel ready uh, and could be used to attract industry. Uh, we also want the consultant to identify best practices in tech commercialization. Over the last couple of years, we uh, have been heavily involved with the Center for Innovation at the U of A Tech Park. Uh, we sponsor tech startup companies. And so uh, what are best practices out there that allows us to take that relationship to the next level and further support tech commercialization uh, and entrepreneurs in our community? And then uh, the third best practice will be economic opportunity programming. Uh, so. Incentives is not necessarily a bad word. Many communities uh, use incentives to be able to leverage and attract industry. Uh, we don't have uh, an incentive program in place now. And so uh, this is an opportunity for the consultant to look at what are best practices out there uh, within the confines of the law and how we may be able to use uh, some of the uh, best practices that other communities have implement it for us to adopt, look at, consider uh, as, we, um, as we advance our economic development efforts. Uh, they'll also ultimately make recommendations, uh, establish strategies for us and goals, and then uh, we will have uh, what is the implementation piece of it, which the consultant will assist in that aspect as well. Uh, so the, uh, what you have before you is the contract for our TIP strategies. Uh, they are a privately held company based out of Austin. Uh, they've been around since 1995 and done hundreds of, hundreds of engagements throughout the country with different municipalities. Uh, it was a competitive process uh, through an RFP. Uh, we uh, initially received uh, about eight or nine 
uh, proposals from those eight or nine proposals. We uh, dwindled that down to three, uh, had interviews with the three, and ultimately uh, staff um, landed on TIP strategies based on uh, their scope, the comprehens comprehensiveness of the scope, uh, and also the deliverables and the measurables within, within the scope. Uh, the timeline for the project, if contracts approved tonight, will be uh, starting the project in March, roughly with about a nine month uh, completion process. Uh, the budget is, uh, for the project is uh, a cost not to exceed 150,000. Uh, 75,000 will be funded this fiscal year and 75,000 uh, in the next fiscal year. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Victor, the 75 for this year, that was already included in the budget, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yes. Right, okay, on there. Well, I think, you know, what we did before, you know, we had hydronolics, that was about it, <laughs> you know, in the town, no hospital. Um, those relationships that we've had um, and, and discovered who we have that live in the community that are these startups and entrepreneurs, I don't think if we hadn't done the first round, we wouldn't have discovered um, our potential. So, um, you know, I'm certainly in favor of it, but any other questions for Victor? Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, Victor, so the, the deliverable is this master plan? Is that what I'm getting out of this? I, 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 I mean, I heard all that you said, I'm just trying to close the loop now. Yes. Uh, Members of the council, to deliver is going to be the economic development master plan. Uh, the plan itself will have uh, a lot of content. It'll have uh, what is the initial uh, SWOT analysis of the community, uh, the competitive advantages. We'll have the industry cluster report. Uh, so we'll have a number of reports that will detail the industry. Uh, within there, we'll also have reports on best practices. Uh, and so we'll have uh, that narrative um, and deliverable, and then we'll, uh, they'll formulate uh, what would be strategies that we can then implement uh, and, and a plan that uh, council can uh, review and, and adopt uh, once it's in its uh, uh, draft format. Thank yeah, and, you. And I know one of the important things to be so careful of, which I think this will show us, incentives have been more difficult um, and it, Council can weigh in in the future on that, but you know, to pass the gift clause and all of that, that's only gotten more complicated. So I'd love to hear, you know, what are those possibilities uh, moving forward if that's the way we chose to do. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. One thing I do want to point out, I miss in my comments, is that uh, typically we're calling an economic development master plan. Other communities refer it as a comprehensive economic development strategy. Uh, but these documents are also important to have in place for uh, uh, grant funding or uh, uh, going after grant uh, programming. Uh, give you an example, uh, we would have not been able to secure EDA funding without the adoption of an economic development master plan. So not only does it provide us a, a roadmap uh, for the areas that we want to focus, and strategies for economic development, but also becomes a tool that we can leverage to secure uh, funding, whether it's grant or other resources for economic development programming. Would I be correct in comparing it to going after a grant for a road? If it's not designed, if we haven't done the environmental studies, you miss those opportunities to go after them. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion at this time. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, I'm uh, moved to approve contract 230040. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, for us, for this, uh, this agenda, uh, we are adjourned for this evening, but our work isn't done. We're going to reconvene in about five minutes upstairs for an executive session. So you get to go home. We don't. <laughs> but thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Huh? Oh yeah, it's great. <laughs>